so we're going to briefly talk about GraphQL and really more like w why it's important for you know network and security engineers. And we uh, so first cover the technology, and then we'll look at two use cases where you're um, most likely going to have to deal with that at some point. So very briefly about me, uh, co-founder CEO of Popsmail, where we love GraphQL. We've been using it. Um, it's the first interface to our, our product, and uh, so yeah, I. Uh, you can find me on, on LinkedIn and, uh, and GitHub. So what is GraphQL? GraphQL is a, both a query language and a schema language uh, that is used to define API. So in many ways, it's like an alternative to REST. That's probably the best way to think about it. And so why it was invented initially is because REST hasn't been designed to be efficient. There's usually like a lot more data that you query when you actually need to access something in REST. And so that, that was really the idea of making the design efficient for the API and uh, easier to consume. Initially, it was developed at Facebook to actually optimize uh, the uh, mobile app to make sure that the mobile app will only require and query the information that, that, they, uh, that they need and, and not more. So it's been around since uh, 2015. But for the last few years, actually, we've been seeing more and more applications in our space also now using that. So to give you an idea, that's on the left, uh, how looks a GraphQL query. So as you see, compared to REST, the main thing is you have to define uh, exactly what you want to have. So for example, here, I'm, I'm connecting to uh, Infra, which has a lot of information about network device and interface. But here I'm saying all I want is to connect uh, the object type, which is Infra device. And for those, all I need is the name of those devices. And that's all I'm going to get back. And then we also have the ability to add filters. But now where it gets very interesting is with this one query language, I can access absolutely everything in my database. So for example, if I go deeper, I could say now for each of my device, I also want to access the interfaces. And here the example, just for lack of space in, the, in this screen is pretty simple, but I could go even deeper. I could say I want to access the IP address on those interface. I want to access the, the nodes that are connected to those interface. I want to access any information that are basically uh, described in my schema in my database. And then I can uh, access everything in, in one query. So if we, if we look at it again compared to REST, previously in REST, if I wanted to access the same information, I would have you know, usually uh, one query to access the device, one query to access the interface, one query to access the IP address. You can already see that from the client perspective, there's three queries. And then if I want to use all of that, I need to process that data on the client side to actually make use of it. So there was a lot more processing on the client side. With GraphQL, the way it works is you have one interface, one query, and the client is able to express what he wants to query, and then he gets only the information that he wants. And you will see, we'll see later as we talk about use cases, but that, that has a huge implications on how we're actually consuming uh, data. So if you look at GraphQL, uh, a key component of GraphQL is it's, it's really schema driven. At the center of it, there is this schema. And then if we look at the top, there's three type of interface or uh, query that we can have with GraphQL. So the first one is what they call query, which is reading information. Then they have what they call mutation, which is anything that will make a change. So any create, update, delete will usually be done through a mutation. And then one that is less known is there's also the concept of subscriptions in GraphQL that is built in. It's not often implemented, but it's this idea that you could also have more of a pub sub where you could basically run your query and say, hey, I'm going to keep the connection open. And every time there's something new, I want you to send me the information without me requesting for it, which again was initially implemented uh, for websites that automatically get updated uh, very quickly. Now. GraphQL itself, and even if it's confusing, confusing because there's this notion of graph, is not specific or doesn't have anything to do with the type of database that we use uh, in the back end. Like it can work on top of a SQL database, it can work on top of a graph database, or no SQL database. And in uh, the, the eco GraphQL ecosystem, we usually talk about resolvers. So only really developers or people that are building GraphQL APIs have to worry about that, but I thought as we're you know, going through more of a, a tutorial on it, it would be interesting to, uh, to mention that. 
because we have such a strong schema, what's interesting is we usually have very uh, user, I will say, uh, um, it's, it's very easy for users, like, the, for example, there's this uh, playground that really helps you to build your query, explore the schema. Uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to consume, and, and all of that is because it comes because we have this uh, schema that is uh, defined at its core. Uh, you usually have built-in documentation, so it's also a very nice side effect of having a GraphQL interface. We're talking this morning, for example, of like in the, this world of AI, we need tomorrow to have AI agents that will connect to our, our databases, to our sources of truth, to collect all of those data. They certainly will work very well with GraphQL because if you give them access to this interface, they will have a complete documentation of everything and they will be able to uh, query those information. One thing that's important to keep in mind when we talk about GraphQL is the cost of the query because you know you can you have the full access to the underlying database and technically you can write any query and you can write a query that query a lot of objects with very little data like I did earlier I just want the name of a device or you could query for one object uh, a lot of sub object like I could query one device and all the interface and all the IP addresses so it's this notion that we call the depth of the query and the number of top-level objects. And what's important to keep in mind is that you can query on one dimension, you can query on the other one, but as you start querying on both of them, then you know, it's pretty much you're asking for the entire content of the database to be returned in one query. And you know, at some point, there's just things that are not gonna work. So that's the kind of things as a, as a user, it's like this, you know, with great power comes great responsibility and, and things we have uh, to be careful about. So make sure to never, run a query that requests all the objects uh, and uh, with a really uh, big depth of the query. And it's also why usually GraphQL interfaces are not exposed to internet. Because of that, it's like it's, if you don't trust the clients that are making those queries, that can uh, lead, lead to like a, a, a denial of service or, but it's, it's much more popular actually internally inside uh, different companies. There's a lot of other features we're not gonna talk about, but you can have variables, there's notion of fragments, there's notion of um, federation also in GraphQL that is very popular, notion of introspections, but uh, just for a matter of time, we, uh, we're gonna skip to the use case. So in terms of use cases, there's really two I think that are important as the network and security engineers. The first one is, at some point, you're gonna have to secure those applications. It's like now you have this new traffic, previously we had a lot of and we have a lot of tooling that have been built around the idea of REST. We understand REST traffic. It's layer seven traffic, it's HTTP, there is the status code. We understand like, how we differentiate what kind of query is being requested. And you'll see that now with GraphQL, it's, it's very different because we don't have the same information and how we actually secure this traffic will need to be done differently. And the second one that's more uh, closer to my field is uh, network automation. GraphQL has, in my perspective, really changed how we actually uh, interact with sources of truth, and it really simplified how we can actually uh, extract the data to, um, for example, generate configuration. So we'll talk briefly about those two. I'll, I'll skip quickly just to give you an overview of all the, there's a lot of applications that already support GraphQL today, and you know there's a good chance there's a lot that still don't, but you know anything that exposes some data via REST API today, whether it's vendor, whether it's uh, your different providers, whether it's all the, uh, the peering and uh, NIA space, any of them technically uh, is likely at some point to have this kind of uh, GraphQL interface. So always be on the, on the lookout for it. And I apologize if any of those already support that and I didn't uh, capture it properly. So just to go back to the, oh, to the use case, um, in the 30 second that I have. So uh, I mentioned the traffic about GraphQL is different because there's no more, it's, even though we use REST to make the query to GraphQL, so it looks like REST at first glance, it's technically, it's, everything is always gonna be about 200, so you won't be able to use the status code to actually understand if the request was successful or not. So you're gonna have to look inside the payload to actually understand what's happening. And then same, the endpoint is always gonna be the same. You won't be able to rely on the endpoints and what is actually accessed to understand the permissions and all of that. Everything will be inside uh, the payload. 
And so you need to be careful about the, the batch. And just to close on the, on the network collimation, uh, where again, it's very, very powerful is to grab, for example, all the informations you need uh, to go with a Jinja template. You know, previously there was a lot of complexity, like to generate one configuration for one device, you could make maybe 20 REST API calls to get all of that. Inventory in Ansible tends to be really, really slow. And so uh, with GraphQL, we've been able to really simplify that. And now we have one query to get all the data. We feed that into a Jinja template much more readable, and it really, I think, simplified how we can uh, generate configuration. I'll, in a matter of time, skip that, and uh, if you want to try, I think it's probably the best. There's actually a, a public sandbox that you can use. So if you go at this URL, you'll have like all the application I was showing earlier. You can build your query, you can try, and you can uh, experiment with it. No need to uh, s s sign up or anything, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.